What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-host, Julie Mitchell. How you doing, Julie? Hi, it's good to see you again. I know. This is this is uh, Chief Chat number two in the last hour, right? Yes, sir. It's a twofer today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, you know, when we have a twofer, you know, we are, we got to have some awesome guests. So uh, I'm always, you know, excited about having a fellow devil dog on, on Chief Chat. So, but the thing is, it's real scary to have two former Marines on the podcast because you just never know what's going to come out of our mouths. But, uh, but our, our next guest is here to talk to us about his personal journey on a topic that a lot of us veterans can relate to. So Julie, please introduce our next guest. You got it, Chief. Today's guest served with the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment, nicknamed the Magnificent Bastards, in the first Battle of Ramadi in 2004. That unit suffered the highest casualty rate in the Iraq War, with 20% of the 1,000-man force killed or wounded. Like so many veterans, he struggled when he returned stateside. He decided he needed to do something dramatic to restart his life. So he set out on a cross-country walk to reconnect with fellow Marines and family members of fallen warriors. His story is chronicled in the new documentary, Bastards Road. Please welcome Marine Corps combat veteran John Hancock to Chief Chat. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and anytime I get to share my story uh, and help veterans out, I'm, I'm always down to do it. It is our honor to have you with us today. And for everybody watching, please drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. You can leave some comments for John and we will read them live. If you follow us and enable your notifications, you'll stay in the know about our military exclusive lineup just for you the rest of the summer. Uh, so, John, my brother, man, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Can you, can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from today? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm down in Tucson, Arizona. So it's, uh, we got the monsoons rolling through, so we got some pretty good thunderstorms. So we're uh, breaking up some of this heat right now. So that's always nice. Yeah, that's always good. Uh, so can you, can you get, kind of give us a little uh, kind of history on your military background? What, what made you join the service? I, uh, I was a Navy brat, and so I was born in Honolulu and then moved all over the world. My dad was a uh, uh, XO on a, on submarines, and uh, so we were all over the world, and then finally kind of moved into uh, Maryland, and, and I call Maryland my home because I did all four years of high school there. Uh, but, you know, I was, I think we were, I was 10, maybe even younger, and I saw a Marine in uh, Upper Rice Lip in the commissary in England, and uh I, I saw this just mountain of a man and I looked at my dad and I was like, who is that? And he goes, oh, it's a force reconnaissance Marine. Those are the most badass things on the planet. Yeah. And I was like, well, I, I, that's what I want to do. Then I want to be a Marine. And then from that day forward, it was just, I want to be a Marine. And, uh, you know, I got to high school and the recruiters are in the cafeteria. I'm in ninth grade and I'm like, hey, man, I'm all right, let's join. I want to go right now. And they're like, all right, slow down there. Spark plug, like graduate high school first. <laughs> and then We'll talk about it after that. So, yeah, I graduated high school. And uh, I think two weeks later, I was uh, standing on those yellow footprints. Uh, and then so I served in Second Italian Fourth Marines from 2001 to, to the end of 2004 uh, and then laterally moved, got a new MOS and went to the 0211 field. Uh, became a counterintelligence, human intelligence specialist. Did another almost five years there and got out at the end of 09. So so I'm, I'm taking it, uh, since you were in Maryland, you went to Paris Island. You weren't a Hollywood Marine like like myself. I, I, was, a, I was a Hollywood Marine. That is <laughs> correct. I, uh, sand fleas and swamps, man. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's 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 their claim to fame uh, in Paris Island is it's, it's sand fleas. While yeah. We're, we're climbing mountains and all kind of other craziness over there. It, it, I know. I I tell you what, man. I uh, when I when I got into when I went over to the Victor unit when I went to two four, you know, I get off the plane in San Diego. I take the USO shuttle up into Pendleton, and it's like I don't know ten o'clock at night, and I got a couple other Marines uh, in the shuttle with me. I'm like, yeah, I'm new. I'm checking in, and I'm looking at all these mountains, and I was like, you guys hike these? And he's like, oh yeah, you're gonna hike a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. I, I just quick story like we were in a, a marine combat training and we we had to do night we had to, it was night night navigation right we we were doing the the, the navigation and of course your, your compass is telling you go this way but it's a freaking freaking mountain <laughs> right and, and so for marines we don't we can just go straight we don't we right. don't think about anything else except for go for the direction 
that the, that the direction tells us to go to. Right. Man, so we go up this mountain and we're freaking dead tired to the world. And there's and instructors go around this road. This is a road that goes like right around the mountain that gets to the exact same spot we're trying to go to. And I'm like, yeah, there starts the lessons, right? The lessons right. are like absolutely. Yeah. And then you learn real quick, smarter, not harder. Yeah, absolutely. John, you have truly an, an inspiring tale. Can you give us the background on what was behind your decision to make this walk across America? Well, you know, I had I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps in end of 09 and, and went right into University of Maryland. I was double majoring in Arabic and Russian. Uh, I already spoke those languages, so I was going to kind of phone it in. And, uh, you know, as, as I kept going through class, uh, I was having I was having a lot of problems uh, assimilating and dealing with uh, coming back from eight tours in combat and then uh, listening to these uh, college kids just spout this nonsense. Uh, and I just, I couldn't align with it. I couldn't, I couldn't listen to them anymore. And I, I found the bars instead of going to class. And so I was drinking a lot. Uh, there's the first DUI after the first one, there's a second one, almost a year to the day of the first one. Uh, and after that second one, for some reason, the cop didn't arrest me and he, he dropped me back off home. Uh, and I decided I was going to end it that night. And uh, so I went in and I uh, looked myself in the mirror and, you know, Hey man, you're, um, you're a big piece of junk. And, you know, you've, you've kind of just kind of degraded your name, your family's name, the Marine Corps name. You don't need to be here. You're not a good father. You're not a good son. Uh, you're not a good friend. Uh, and so I started emptying uh, pills into my stomach. And as those pills started to take hold, I was realizing uh, exactly that I was dying and I didn't want to do that. And so I hopped in my car, uh, which was about 400 meters from my house at the time, um, drove to the Baltimore VA hospital from College Park, Maryland. It's about a 45 minute trip. I made that trip in about 17 minutes. Uh, wow. So I was, I was cooking. I broke every law on the road to try to save myself. I got to the emergency room, told them what I had done. Immediately, they whisked me back uh, into some room. And there it is. It's tubes, it's nodes. It's, uh, and then I'm handcuffed to a bed. Uh, it was all pretty bad. And so I wound up in the psych ward uh, in the Baltimore VA hospital. I was there for about five or six days as I was sitting there. I think it was like one of the last days I was there uh, on the news, there was a guy named Mike Vitti. Uh, he'd started something called Legacies Alive. And man, he was just an inspiration to me. And he was he had been walking one kilometer for each person being killed in Iraq or Afghanistan since the 01 kickoff. And I just and he was ending at the Army Navy game in MT Bank Stadium in Baltimore here in another like I think month after that, and he was going to end at halftime. And I, it just spoke to me and I got out of the psych ward, realized I wanted to do this, realized I wanted to go meet with my brothers that I served with in the battle of Ramadi, meet with the gold star families of our fallen and kind of tell them what I had done. Maybe this was almost a penance walk for me, if you will, uh, in the beginning, you know, I'm kind of trying to tell people that I'm sorry, reaching out for my own sanity, my own help. And so I got on a mountain bike because I was, I didn't know how to do this. I was 308 pounds. I had been eating and drinking my feelings for years. Uh, and so I got on a mountain bike and I rode my mountain bike for like 10 months uh, and went from 308 to 198 pounds and okay. then said, okay, now I can go walk across the country. And so September 11th, 2015, 115 in the morning, uh, there's no, there's no significance for that time. I was just super excited to go and I couldn't sleep. And I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go now. Uh, so I started walking and, uh, yeah, so, you know, 5,807 miles later, 19 states, seven pairs of shoes. Uh, I ended uh, December 12th, 2016 uh, at the Camp Pendleton 5th Marines War Memorial Gardens. Oh, man, that's, man, that's, 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 a, that's a whirlwind of a story, uh, but a, definitely a story that a lot of people can relate to, a lot of veterans can relate to specifically. Um, yeah. And, and there have been a lot of books and movies about, you know, PTSD, uh, but Bastard's Road seems more about, a, you know, growth and finding oneself. So uh, can you, can you kind of share what message you're hoping uh, everybody gets from watching the movie? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it is it is absolutely about growth and it is absolutely about camaraderie. And uh, it's very real. It's very raw. It's uncut. Um, I don't hold any punches. I needed to tell you what I was going through in the most raw way I could so that people could understand it. And I think one, I hope first and foremost that it helps uh, veterans, that they understand that they're not alone and that uh, here I am telling people what I've done uh, and then I've come out on the other side. Uh, it, it's possible and it's uh, it's just one foot in front of the other, you know, and then for the civilian side of the house, I really hope to kind of be this bridge to uh, 
gain some understanding, bring, bring the civilian population into the conversation so we can actually make changes here uh, and understand that uh, the, the epidemic of, of veteran suicide is out of control. Uh, and it's something that uh, needs to have a, a larger spotlight. And it, we're done with the awareness thing. Uh, I'm done with it. What I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm trying to change things. Uh, and I need people to help me change it. And the only way I can do that is by talking about it. Yeah, no, that's, and I, I know you, me and you are very, very familiar with, um, you know, you kind of go do your thing and you come back and you don't talk about it. That, that's, that's just how we've always, you know, I guess grown to, to deal with problems. Um, and, and, and so even, so we've had the you know pleasure of having a lot of different uh, veterans on here that have had uh, Medal of Honor recipients and, and they come back home and, you know, their closest family members uh, don't even know anything about what they were dealing with. Um, and so it's, it's super therapeutic, I'm sure, for you to let that off your chest. And also a good example for veterans that are going through that right now to say, you know what, if you can do it, I, I can talk about it as well. You're right, man. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's that first step, right? It's that first telling the first person and it just gets easier from there. Uh, and, you know, you tell two or three people that really listen, uh, you, you, you're going to start changing. You're going to start feeling better about it. Uh, you can't hold this stuff in. You can't bottle this in for, uh, for years. Uh, it, that's, not how, that's not how the human condition works anyway. Uh, and we need to speak about these things. And so if I've got to lay myself naked on the altar of humility and say, I'll, I'll go first, guys, then I have to. Uh, if that helps somebody else, then that's what I'm doing. Awesome. So, you know, it's a long stretch from one side of the country to the other, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure there was some long, some, some time to really kind of, you know, process things and, and, and kind of get somewhere mentally. And I know it's, it's always easy to, to give up. So how did you fight through those urges of, of, of stopping? You know, I had quit everything I had tried after the Marine Corps. Uh, I had, I had quit college. I had quit jobs. I had quit relationships. I just quit everything. Uh, and that was my MO. And I didn't want to do that anymore. And I was, I, I was about two weeks into the walk. I was down by Fort AP Hill on 301. Uh, and I wanted to quit, man. I didn't know what I was doing. So I called my mother and I told her what I just wanted to quit. And she goes, you know, I can come pick you up. You're about three hours away. And I was like, man, I've been walking for two weeks. I'm only three hours away. <laughs> like, this, this, I'm never going to finish this yeah. thing. And, uh, but right there, I was given this out and I was given this opportunity to quit yet again. And I just, something in me said, don't do it. Like, don't quit. And so I hung up after about a two hour conversation with my mom. I just kept walking and I got down to Virginia beach, started meeting with some of the boys that were down there uh, and then just kept going. And I just decided, I was like, I'm just going to empty my gas tank. And what I, what I didn't realize was that my gas tank was never going to be empty uh, because every meeting that I went on, every time I met with somebody, a new, another brother, another gold star family, it just reinvigorated me. It just gave me more strength. Uh, and I just kept going. And then, you know, you always want to quit when you're out in the middle of the sand hills in Nebraska and there's nothing around for, you know, 190 miles in any direction. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, but then you're like, okay, so I quit. Well, then I still got to walk 190 miles to the airport, so I, <laughs> you know, and in that time, you're just, you're just continually going over all your memories. And that's what I was doing. I was almost, and it, it became uh, almost like this uh, ambulatory cognitive behavioral therapy for me. Uh, and I was accessing all these memories that were so debilitating to me earlier and would cause me or I would want to go drink uh, just to kind of quell them. And now I was using physicality and, you know, 30 miles a day with 70 pounds on my back. Uh, and I was using that as the form of therapy to really process those memories. And so I'm able now to remember these memories because I'll always have them. Uh, but it's how I access them. Right. And it's how you how you allow them to be in your life. Uh, and so I realized later on that I could now access these memories uh, without them being so debilitating and that uh, I became uh, kind of a mouthpiece. Uh, and so I would just start speaking about them and telling other people about it. And that really was the therapy for me. Man, big shout out to mom, man, for for uh, for, for keeping you going. Right. Yeah, brother. She's 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 a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> Moms tend to feel that way about their sons. I don't <laughs> You touched on this a little bit, John. Um, but can you tell us 
about those reunions with your fellow Marines who had commonalities with you, who had shared experiences. What were those reunions like along your journey? And what, what did they mean to you? Well, they meant everything. Uh, and it was the whole reason I started this thing. Uh, I wanted to go help them. I wanted to see them. And uh, no time passes, right? Because you, you guys are you guys leave, leave the Marine Corps, you scatter to the winds, you go and move on with your life. Uh, and then you see each other again, you know, 10 years down the road. And it's like, no time has passed at all. We pick yeah. up right where you left off. Uh, and it was absolutely one of the most cathartic things I had done. And then to, to meet with these gold star families, a lot of them I'd never met before. And to meet these families and understand what they're struggling with, the daily grief that they go through, and then to be able to be there for them, to listen to them, to share weird, stupid, and sometimes dirty stories about their boys that they absolutely want to hear uh, and that they didn't know before. And uh, that's, that's the amazing thing about a Gold Star family is, is that they, uh, they don't care what it is, they want to know about it. And they uh, they want to hear everything they can about their sons and their daughters. And for me to be able to, to provide some of that and just provide comfort and support, uh, I realized very quickly that the support network that we have uh, is far greater than I've ever actually imagined. And that, you know, I don't have one mom. I got, you know, I got 34 moms and yeah, uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Now we here at, uh, at, at the exchange, I, I've been on the road a few times to different stores and different bases. And uh, I got a chance to be a part of, of our gold star family, like recognition ceremony yeah. uh, at one of our stores. And man, just, you know, just, they, they're, you know, they're there for, for a reason that uh, they have this commonality and they have this bond they have with each other. Uh, yeah. Cause they, they all have similar stories and, and to kind of bring that community together. But the, the fact that you're able to kind of go and fill in some holes Right. Uh, about their their son or daughter that uh, that they didn't know about is, you know, you're kind of keeping that legacy going for that in that individual. Uh, so so they can pass on those stories. But like I think that's that's an awesome thing that you did. Um, and, and to meet with fellow Marines and also uh, go star families, man, that, you know, it makes me want to get out here and start walking, walking <laughs> uh, down 635, maybe. So just go do it. Just grab it. Just grab a rug, grab a flag and let's go do it, man. I'll join in next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can you tell us like what, what was the uh, which, what do you think? What's your toughest part of the journey and most re or more, most rewarding part? Uh, I think the toughest part was was really the isolation uh, and really, you know, between those meetings, uh, being out and having to leave from a brother's house and say, all right, brother, I love you. See you later. Uh, and then just walk away from his house uh, and then start this process all over again. That was tough for me. And but I realized I was strong enough to do it. And as I was continuing to do it, that was uh, that was also one of the most rewarding things for me. It was to be able to uh, finally grasp uh, back on life and really fight back those demons and win. Uh, and that was that was really what it was for me. I was winning again and I was I was causing myself uh, to change. And that's all I want to do. I wanted to shed the old skin. Uh, and then, you know, when I got done, when I, when I ended at Camp Pendleton, second time, fourth Marines, the entire active duty battalion, uh, was there. They lined the street uh, of yeah. the road and then they walked in with me and it was, it was humbling to say the least, man. Uh, and it was just, that was another really rewarding piece of that for me was to, uh, show these new Marines, uh, or, or active current Marines at the time, uh, that, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be faced with challenges on your way out the door, uh, but you can overcome them. And I wanted to show that to those guys. Plus, you know, I'm an older guy now. So I wanted to show them. I was like, Hey man, I can still hang. I still, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way, man. Every time, you know, you see, cause we got, we got, you know, young, young service members that are coming in that were born after 9-11 and, oh, and, yeah, you know, and, and for me to put that in perspective, I'm like, I'm like, Hey, damn, I'm old. And B is like, <laughs> it's like, man, I got, I got to try to stay in shape to kind of keep up with them. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a, like I said, I, I understand it's a, it's a, it, when, when you see them and, and they're like, okay, I see you, I see you old man out there getting it. Right. And so, you know, it, it inspires them just as much as it inspires you though. Yeah, absolutely. John, congratulations on the documentary, Bastards Road. Um, it's getting incredible buzz, a lot of positive reviews. What was it like, though, to, to be documented on such a personal journey and to have those cameras, you know, recording every step? 
You know, Brian, uh, Brian Morrison, the filmmaker, he contacted me. I was about 1300 miles into the walk already. Uh, and he contacted me. I was down in Slidell, Louisiana. I'd already walked all the way down to Miami and kind of traced the Gulf into Louisiana. And uh, he calls me and I thought he just wanted to do some interview. And as I'm talking to him, I'm realizing he wants to like document this. And I was, I, you know, I went to bed that night and I slept on it. I took a hotel for that evening because I had been, I took a hotel once a month because I just wanted a shower and a nice bed because I'm sleeping in a tent on the side of the road the whole time. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I slept on it and I woke up and I just had this like epiphany and I was like, Johnny, keep saying you want to help all these people. You keep saying you want to do this. You, well, then let this guy tell your story. Let this guy in and really give him the story. So I flew back for a VA appointment that I couldn't miss. So I halted the walk for like three or four days. I flew back from Lubbock, Texas into Maryland, went to the VA, met with Brian. We did a two hour interview uh, and I, we kind of felt each other out on camera. And I was like, OK, yeah, I, I, we can do this. And so he would he would fly out another seven or eight times after that. Uh, and he would meet with me for, you know, a week, sometimes eight, nine days. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes two or three days. And he would just film as much as humanly possible. And then he took it upon himself to go fly around the country and meet with uh, all the people I had already met with to get those interviews. Gotcha. And so I didn't have the camera on me all the time, but when I did have the camera on me, I forgot about it uh, because I, I didn't change. It wasn't like I was acting. Uh, it's just, this is who I am and you're going to get me. And, uh, and so sure, roll the camera. Uh, as my boys started coming into screen, uh, and they started being on camera. Uh, at first, it was a little weird for them, uh, but they they would talk to each other. And after, you know, the first couple, they'd call other guys, be like, hey, how was it? And they're like, oh, it's, don't even worry about it. Just it's it's John. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, it just kind of went from there. And, you know, to I guess, you know, Brian, all the, the only question that ever happened by any of my boys uh, about Brian was, is the dude on the level? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And I trust him implicitly. Uh, and, you know, if if he screws this up, uh, we can bury him out back somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you no, know, and he didn't. And, you know, we'd always said, you know, if this documentary sucks, at least we have something for two for at least we have something, you know, documented. Uh, and, and it turns out that it doesn't. Uh, and, you know, I, I looked on Rotten Tomatoes yesterday and we're sitting at 100 percent and I've never seen that. So uh, <laughs> exactly. I, I guess we're doing something right. Absolutely. That's funny that you had to get the co you had to give them the cosign before before your buddies are like, yeah, I don't know about this one. Like, give me the yeah. thumbs up or what? So yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that's that's really how it works anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh you got a very, very captive audience today. We got uh soldiers, airmen, guardians, uh sailors, marines, coast guard members, and military families watching. Uh you got any words of wisdom or or, or inspiration for folks uh, out there listening right now? You know, honestly, if you're struggling. Um, you, first off, you, you don't do this alone. Right. And for the ones that are really at the end of the rope right now, call your brothers, call your sisters, start there. Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable doing that, uh, check in somewhere, man. I mean, if you're at the end of your rope, you've got to, you've got to do something here because you are needed, you are wanted, you are deserving of a good life and peace. Uh, but you have to fight for it and you have to, uh, fight some of these demons that you hold on to and you have to get rid of them. Uh, and the only way to do it is to go back to war with them. And uh, you don't do that yourself. You do that with your uh, with your brothers and your sisters that you trusted uh, in combat. And so do that first. And, you know, as we as we continue to grow, as we continue to show each other who, what we're made of, uh, you know, I think bringing back these reunions, uh, getting together more and more, that'll help. Uh, and for the active duty military component, especially the leadership, uh, I think it is incumbent upon the leadership now uh, to be very open uh, with their soldiers, airmen, Marines, guardians, all of it. I think you need to be open with them, uh, allow them space to communicate what they're going through, uh, because the military is tough. Absolutely, it is. Uh, and, you know, we we kind of pride ourselves on being these silent and quiet professionals. Uh, but inside that quiet professionalism, I think we need to have. Uh, avenues to uh, to speak out and to uh, to I guess relay what we're going through. Now those are, those are awesome awesome words, and uh, I just want to throw another thing in there: is uh, forgive yourself, forgive yeah, yourself. Uh, just learn to forgive because we're we're not all perfect, or, or we're, we're in scenarios where you feel like uh, or maybe survivor's guilt or some mm -hmm. some type of thing that you go through where you're kind of blaming yourself for things. And I think a lot of people uh, 
find it hard forgiving themselves for yeah. what they made in the past. You know, that was hard for me for a long time. Uh, forgiveness was something I, I didn't think I was worthy of. Uh, and so it took a long time for me to start to forgive myself for things I had done, things I hadn't done, uh, the monster I had become later. Uh, and those things, that is, that is a key point is to absolutely start to learn to forgive yourself. Uh, and I don't know how to do that for everybody, but I can tell you, uh, if you get outside and you walk around somewhere and you go walk on a trail or something, doing physical activity will help. Yeah. I love your message of don't do this alone. That is such important advice for anyone who, who is going through a struggle. Um, do you want to pause for a moment and turn to our live uh, Facebook feeds and share some of the viewer comments with you? I'm going to look at Chief's page first, and um, you have several people watching on your page, Chief, and Richie Whitmer says, love hearing his background, inspirational for so many who may struggle. And then I'm going to turn to our Facebook page, um, where we do have people tuning in from all over the world. Uh, Mary Singleton says, this is awesome. John's great. You're making a difference. You have a significant impact in not only veterans' lives, but to so many people who have com contemplated suicide. Um, Mary, Mary's absolutely spot on there. Um, and, Celia, you know, I think, I, I think also there's, um, and the, Mary brings up a really good point here. It's that this film is, yeah, it is absolutely about the military. It is absolutely about my service and what I did afterwards. But there are so many different people from so many different walks of life, civilians who have never served, who align with this film and can understand it and see through, I guess, the, the military piece of it to understand that this is a human story and that uh, all, all of us uh, suffer through some sort of trauma and it is, uh, it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us to deal with it together. Yes, sir. And um, your, your message is resonating Caroline is watching Caroline Lower, and she says, these are stories that civilians need to know about. Yeah. Like you, you're making a difference. And even here with joining us today, and there was one other, a uh, couple other comments I wanted to share too. Um, I just, sorry, I'm scrolling on my phone. Uh, Matt Brewer says, taking care of yourself is the best way to take care of your people. This is something that I know I have struggled with over the years and allowing yourself to do that has changed my leadership style greatly. So take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And um, Rich Castle says, just discovered this, looking forward to watching the documentary. And he is, uh, he says, Memphis, Vietnam veteran. Awesome. And then Ryan Smith is watching from Grapevine. He says he's rented the movie and is going to queue it up tonight. So you're getting tons of love out there, John. That's awesome. I, I, I will give you a warning, bring a box of tissues with you. Uh, I don't think I've met a single person that's got through this movie with a dry eye. So sorry about that in advance, but not sorry. <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the warning. <laughs> we'll get, we'll all get prepared. So as a reminder, Bastards Road, it can be found on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and Dandango. John, is there anything else you'd like viewers to know about the film and your journey? You know, honestly, uh, as we as we continue to push through, uh, especially for the GWAT veterans, right? The global war on terrorism era veterans, guys that have been fighting for 20 years now. Um, we've, we struggle with thank you for your service, right? We struggle with, uh, with that being said to us. We make fun of it. We don't make fun of you for saying it. We make fun of us for how we reply to it. Uh, because, you know, for the, on the combat side of the house, it's what are you thanking me for? Are you thanking me for volunteering and going to combat, killing a kid, you know, watching my buddy die? Uh, and then on the non-combat or the supporting role side of the house, are you thanking me for never getting to go and complete the job or complete the mission as I thought it would be? Uh, and so it's really difficult for us to really kind of wrap our heads around thank you for your service. And I think we get rid of it all together. I think we bring back welcome home. Vietnam didn't get it. And I think that's absolutely a travesty. But I think we bring back welcome home and start to create this homogenous society again, because when you say welcome home, uh, you immediately bring that veteran back into the fold of society. You give them the opportunity to feel part of something versus uh, the derision and an anonymity that sometimes we do feel. Uh, and so I think when we bring back Welcome Home, we then start bringing back the idea of, of positive growth and, uh, and community uh, in, I guess, involvement and bringing veterans back together inside a community uh, so that they can flourish. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, I never thought of it like that. I, I always kind of think of it as, you know, people just trying to be nice. And so I, I take it as you're trying to be nice, even though you may not know how I may process it. You, you, you have a great intent. But, you know, welcome home is very important because, um, you know, when you've been in combat for, like you said, in upwards of 20 years and right. you've had eight tours, like you feel like being in the war zone is more home than being at home. And right. so and, and so, yeah welcome home back back into a, a society where you don't have to uh, or you shouldn't have to watch your back or watch right. your six or or in the foxhole or or whatever the case may be so uh, that's a great perspective that you kind of share with us uh about about that specific you know greeting yeah man and you know and anybody else just to help keep the movie going and and get it to more and more veterans because i know a lot of people uh have seen it uh, but I, I hope that more and more veterans, I want every person in the military that's ever served and everybody in every active duty service component now to be able to see this film. Uh, so the continued word of getting it out, that's that's the help. And I don't make a dime from this. So uh, there's there's no reason, there's no financial gain for me here. All I want to do is help people. Man, that's, that's super noble. Like I said, thank you for spending time with us today, man. It was awesome hearing your story. Um, like I said, you are, you know, talking to a Marine, you can just, you know, we, we have certain jargon that we just yeah. like, okay, it takes me back to 97, 98, when yeah. uh, I was a, a private first class trying to figure it all out. <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were the days, definitely. But uh, this, this means a lot to our service members, families, veterans uh, all over the world. Like you said, even civilians that, you know, may not have been in combat or may, you know, ha or, or they're supporting military members, but they, they kind of get a in-depth look at like, okay, this is what folks are really dealing with. Um, yeah. You know, coming back from, from, the and you know, this is just one story, but uh, ultimately so many veterans align with it. I think if you have a veteran in your life that is struggling and, a, and you're a family member of uh, this is a good place to start too. I think you, uh, I think you watch this film it probably gives you a, a little bit more of an eye opening idea of what, uh, what your, your loved one may be going through. Yes. Well, well, thank you so much, John, man. We appreciate you. Uh, we yeah, got man. through this interview without saying any F-bombs. Like, I am surprised. No F-bombs at all, man. So <laughs> I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> We're still on if you want to let it fly. No, right? Just, <laughs> just kidding. Now, I'll just say F-bomb. How about that F-bomb? There you go. And, but no, thank you, man. We appreciate your story. Like I said, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm ready to see the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm definitely going to uh, look at it. Uh, and I'm, I want to probably bring my kids and, and, and my wife in, on the fold too to watch it with me so they can get a kind of understanding of why, why dad goes to the couch and just kind of sits there with his mouth wide open uh, looking go. at looking at ESPN. So, uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, th so thank you for that, man. Uh, if you don't mind uh, holding hold on while we get off live because I, I got to uh, get some information from you. But yeah, man, we wish you all the best. Good luck on the film. We love you, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks so Welcome much. Welcome home, John. Thank, thank you very you. much. All right. Keep Chi chat out. out.